All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, thanks so much for taking a little bit of your Tuesday evening to come and join us here for the Resilient Future Series. Um, yeah, yeah, this is super exciting again tonight. So uh, I'm going to just start off with a couple of logistics uh, before we dive into tonight's session. Uh, but first off, so this is part three of our series tonight. And I guess the first thing I'd like to say is we just crossed a thousand people signed up for the series today. So uh, that definitely speaks to, you know, the, the interest level in the conversations that we're having right now. Uh, so I wanted to give a quick shout out and a thank you to everybody that's been helping share this and, and passing it on. Uh, and for everybody that's been sending me such nice messages. Uh, after every call, I've got like a flood of emails from folks uh, saying how much they appreciate it. I got a ton after Shannon's calls last week. So thanks so much. Uh, I'm glad folks are enjoying it. Um, I'm going to just throw a quick link down here just in case you missed the replay from last week. I just threw the, the link up in the chat there uh, so you can grab that if you want it. And uh, maybe just say hello in the chat really quick. Let us know where you're coming in from tonight. That would be great to, to kind of hear from folks here where you're coming in from. So before I bring on tonight's guest, tonight we have Alain here from Verge Permaculture, which is a really amazing organization. Uh, I'm really excited about this chat. They're just a wealth of knowledge and doing some super innovative things uh, when it comes to growing food, when it comes to energy um, and more regenerative energy um, and things like water harvesting, um, some really, really amazing and really, really relevant topics to this overall theme. So the theme of this, this series and the whole reason behind it, you know, uh, the last couple of years, I've been thinking about how much just the weight of the world has been weighing on people. Um, you know, everything from the state of the economy and inflation to seeing how fragile some of our, uh, you know, our healthcare system, our supply chain issues. Uh, I think a lot of people have been really just kind of feeling those things. And then layer on top of that, things like environmental degradation and climate change. Uh, it's, it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole and start spinning out on that mentally. So what I wanted to do is put together a series that was actually facing, you know, some of these major challenges of our times in a really positive and proactive light uh, and really showcasing people that are doing really innovative and adaptive things um, to, to work with the, the reality of the world that we're in right now. And our goal with this series is to actually take uh, to look at things and make them very practical for the people that are tuning in. Um, so we're, we're really looking at like actionable things that you as, you know, whoever you are, uh, wherever you are in the world, things that you can actually do that make you feel empowered and a little bit more positive about the future uh, and feel like, you know, you're putting things in place to keep your family, your uh, community uh, safe and hopefully, you know, contributing back to the world in a, in a good way. So that, that's kind of the theme here of the whole thing. Practical solutions for uncertain times, the Resilient Future series. So I mentioned this was the fourth, uh, sorry, this is our third call tonight in the series. We've got four more coming up. Uh, next week, we have Yarrow Willard on from uh, Wild Rose Herbal College. So that's going to be a really interesting one. Uh, and we're going to kind of pick up a little bit of where we off from where we started the first week. The first week, we had Dr. Noman Naeem on. Um, and we were, I did actually an opening around emergency preparedness. And Dr. Noman was talking about um, uh, mental and emotional health as a skill set for functioning in uncertain times. Um, and next week, we're going to be chatting with Yaro about how to actually support our bodies in a, a good way. And it seems very, very relevant as we start to hear about how, uh, at least here in Canada, and I've been hearing similar stories from the States and Europe, how many challenges we're seeing in the medical system right now from long wait times and people not getting in. Uh, you know, preventative and proactive healthcare seems like it's, it's going to be a very, very important theme uh, in the near future. And anything that we can learn to empower our own healthcare or even our ability to support people. Uh, while they're waiting on advanced medical care seems very, very relevant. Um, so that's where we're going to be going next week a little bit with Yarrow Willard. Uh, so hopefully some of you will tune in for that. And hopefully some of you will share the series uh, and, and let some more folks know in about it. So before I bring on tonight's guest, Alain, um, I've been, those of you that have been here from the start, you'll notice I've been starting these uh, calls off with a, a little bit of a theme. And that theme is sharing a little bit of gratitude. Uh, and I've come to uh, I come to believe that um, gratitude in and of itself is a survival skill and a skill of resiliency. Uh, you know, in, in some of the hardest challenges, challenging times of my life, uh, it's been being able to search for that little glimmer of gratitude uh, has been what's gotten me through it. So uh, I'm going to start off tonight and just share, you know, I, I have a real privilege thing to be able to do today. I got to spend the day out on a freshwater lake with a fishing rod in my hand with a big hole through the ice. Uh, it was super cold out there with the wind, but I spent the day fishing. Uh, we caught a beautiful white fish that we're going to be eating for dinner tomorrow night. And I'm so thankful to live in a land with clean water still. 
Uh, I know there's so many places in the world where that's becoming a real big challenge, you know, access to clean drinking water. So I'm, I'm so grateful to have that here. And as I acknowledge that or, or say that, I want to also just acknowledge, you know, the number of places, even in my own country, Canada, that don't have clean drinking water. And I think to some of the many Indigenous communities up north that have had their water polluted by mines and things of that nature. Uh, and I just want to hold them in my heart as I, as I share my gratitude for the clean water I have. And I guess the other thing I'd like to share for gratitude to, tonight is gratitude for all those people throughout the ages who have done their best to, to protect waters. Or, or at very least to treat waters with respect and to not, not pollute them. Um, and to understand the habitat around the edges of the water that are so essential to that water being clean. Uh, I think to the first peoples of these lands, you know, where I live, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people who have literally been tending the waters uh, and tending the forests around them for thousands of years. Uh, so much respect and honor for that. Um, and for modern day people, you know, who are aware um, that water is life and water is precious. So shout out to all those that are making a conscious effort uh, to, to keep our waters healthy going forward. And, you know, may we all have clean drinking water is my, my prayer of the night here. So that's my gratitude tonight. And uh, as I'm bringing on our guest tonight, Alain, I would invite you to share. What are you feeling grateful for? Share some gratitude in the chat and let's bring our minds together in a positive way uh, as we dive into some kind of crazy and intense topics at times. So um, what are you feeling thankful for tonight? I'd love to hear from you. And as I say that, I'll invite uh, our guest on tonight, Alain. Um, as he's coming on here, um, I'll share. So I first came across Verge Permaculture, geez, over a decade ago. And I don't even remember where I first came across them. It might have been an essay I read, uh, read by uh, Rob Avis, who's one of the other members of Verge. Um, and it was on this concept of anti-fragility. And I'd never heard of this concept before. You know, I was kind of getting into permaculture at the time and exploring all these terms like sustainability and regenerative living and all these various terms. And uh, Rob introduced me to this concept of anti-fragile. And I'm not going to speak to that too much tonight because I think Elena is going to be speaking to it at length. But I actually got the fortune of interviewing Rob a number of years ago. Uh, and we had a very, very fascinating conversation on this topic. So I'm really excited to kind of kick off the next part of it tonight. Um, so welcome on, Elena. Maybe before you dive into your presentation, what are you feeling thankful for tonight, Elena? Oh, man, I'm feeling thankful for you, Chris. I think that was a really fantastic opening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, 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 the concept of gratitude and, and the importance of, of gratitude. I, I start, I have a morning practice every morning. I start off my day with a little bit of gratitude and it really sets me up for success. So I really, I really do enjoy doing that. And I'm really grateful for the fact that you, that you brought up water because I'm going to be talking about water a little bit today. Um, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of stuff to try and distill into a very short presentation today. So I'm going to be briefly touching on a lot of these topics. But for sure, I'm going to dive into anti fragility and and water and 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 this general feeling of gratitude that we can feel in combination with our landscape. So I'm grateful for the fact that I'm still able to live in partnership with a, a beautiful landscape that is um, by far not beyond repair. And I love that you're bringing in the not beyond repair part. That's an important one to cling on to when when things sometimes feel challenging. Do you want to, before you do your presentation, do you want to just give us a really like quick, quick overview of what Verge is all about and then, and then take it away for the night? Yeah. Yeah. So Verge Permaculture, you know, um, I joined the team not that long after studying through Verge Permaculture, but it was founded by Rob and Michelle Avis. Both of them are engineers and um, we teach permaculture. We're an online education business. Now what sets us apart a little bit is we take kind of a scientific approach to permaculture design. So we really try to break down uh, the various things that are within our sphere of concern, which I'll talk about a little bit today as well. Um, and we try to distill those things into actionable steps that we can put into place for uh, regenerating landscapes and living in tandem with these landscapes in order to generate abundance for ourselves, for the earth, and, and for the people around us. And so if you're totally new to permaculture, if you've never heard the term before, I'll do my best to explain that a little bit today. Um, but it's a pretty broad topic. There's a lot that 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 is encompassed under the the umbrella of permaculture. But in short, we offer permaculture design courses. We offer we have a membership site um, where we have this fantastic active community of permaculture practitioners from across the world. Um, but certainly, uh, most of which I would say are uh, you know Canada, United States. We we have a large focus on cold climate permaculture awesome. design. Sweet. Well, I'm excited to dive in. I just thought of one other logistical thing I just forgot to mention there. 
Uh, folks, so this series is hosted by myself, Chris Gilmore. I run Chris Outdoors in partnership with Earth Activist Training, uh, who also do some permaculture stuff. And Charles is in the chat tonight from Earth Activist Training. So maybe, Charles, can you just say hi in the chat really quick? Just so folks connect it to a name down in the chat there. Um, so if you see Charles posting stuff in the chat, you know, if um, Alain or myself, there's Charles saying hi, everyone. So if Alain or myself mentions a book or a link and you see Charles putting stuff, he might be kind of sharing some of the links as we go through tonight. Uh, and Charles is going to be speaking actually two nights from today. Uh, so not next week, but the, the following week, I believe we're going to have Charles on as our guest for the night. So that's all. Oh, yeah. And we're going to be approximately an hour tonight. Uh, no real rough timelines, but um, or sorry, no real like cutoff time, but approximately an hour. So I'll pass it over to you, Alain. Um, and I'm just going to turn my screen off and let you take the show and I'll, I'll jump back on. You can just let me know when you want me to jump back on. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Okay, then share my screen here. Bear with me. All right. So let me know in the chat, folks, if you can see my screen okay before I go ahead and carry on here. There it goes. I think you can. All right. Thanks, Bonnie. All right. So so oh, um, I was asked today to come in to talk about anti-fragility, and I, and I put here in pursuit of resilience. You know, resilience is a term that, you know, it's being used during this conference, and it's something that we all kind of relate to, right? This idea of resilience, of being strong, of enduring. Um, I am going to propose another term today, and Chris alluded to that, which is anti-fragility, which is actually a little bit beyond resilience. It's uh, anti-fragility in short, and, and I won't spoil it too much, but in short, is uh, a system or something that actually thrives when it's disturbed, when you apply disturbance to it, it thrives under chaos. So we're going to be talking about that just a little bit today. Now, the sort of journey that I'm going to be taking, I'm going to be, I'm going to be diving into a couple of the, 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 the problems or the challenges, so to speak, that exist in the world. Now, I don't want to focus too many on those, but it is important to be able to see what exists within what I consider our sphere of concern, which again, I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and, and use that to inform the actions that we take in our lives to find those solutions. So it's important that we glance at kind of the, the, the overlying concerns that we might have in the world, the things that might make us feel overwhelming uh, or feel overwhelmed, and then, and then take that energy and really focus in and hone in on solutions that we can put into practice. And that's really what permaculture is um, in short. So in pursuit of resilience, but I'm gonna propose in pursuit of anti-fragility, which perhaps doesn't quite read so well on a slide, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll stay with me here. Now, as I mentioned, Verge is an online education business. Our big focus is on helping homesteaders, both urban and rural. I say homesteaders in a very loose way. Um, if you are living on a, on, a, on a piece of land, or even if you, if you don't, and you're living in, a, in an apartment and, and what you have access to is a balcony, you can be a homesteader too. Uh, it's more of a mindset. You know, it's kind of like the blues. You know, it's, it's less just music and it's more of a state of mind. Um, and that's what I consider homesteader, homesteading to be. So whether you're urban or rural, uh, a lot of this is going to apply to you. Uh, and we, ha we help homesteaders build resilience using permaculture design. So we help people focus in and develop what, what I consider eco-literacy or the permaculture lens. It's the sort of way of, of viewing the world. It's a, it's a paradigm that you develop. And I'm going to be talking about that today because that's really the first step in adopting permaculture design as a practice is you really have to get your paradigm straight and, and view the world maybe a little differently than you do now. And, but maybe some of you are already existing within the regenerative paradigm and you just haven't been able to put words to it yet. Uh, but we'll talk about that and, and you'll be able to check your paradigm as, as part of this um, as well. Now, uh, our big focus at Verge is, is live education. We love that community interaction, that direct interaction. So we host live PDCs, we host, we host live masterclasses, we host live events all the time. And that's important because we live in a digital age, but we still crave that community, that connection. So, of course, I'm eternally grateful for Chris and, and his team for putting on uh, a, live, uh, a live event like this because it allows us to connect with each other, which I think is important and certainly is the use of appropriate technology here in this case. Uh, and we also host here at Verge a robust community of practitioners as well. Uh, and we have a free community, which you can, you can definitely check out if you'd like online. Uh, okay, so uh, just a little bit about me before we get started, uh, my history. So I am sitting here in eastern Ontario, um, right near the Quebec and, and New York state borders uh, in the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, now I've got a long career in, in, in permaculture-esque 
type of work, I guess, for over 10 years. I've worked in the nonprofit sector, uh, developing school garden programs, community garden programs. I've successfully developed school garden programs in over a dozen schools in my area that have lasted to this day. Maybe not all of them, but a significant number of them have lasted to this day. Um, I've often worked in local food advocacy. I've generated, I've created events or I've been part of events centered around uh, food advocacy, uh, food procurement, um, just general local food resilience. Um, I've installed public forest gardens. I've successfully garnered uh, support from local town councils to install forest gardens on municipal properties. Um, I, again, I've been part of events and festivals. So I've have, I have a sort of long career in, in the nonprofit sector, working within the community. Now I live on a rural homestead. We have 10 acres here where we raise our own uh, uh, dairy cow. So we, we have raw milk, uh, bees, we run uh, orchards and, and uh, gardens, uh, you know, chickens, both for, for meat and for eggs. Uh, and for the ecosystem services that all of those animals and all of these systems provide. Uh, we also are, are stewards of a, a beautiful uh, wetland, a marsh, um, that is full of willow, which is, which is a resource in and of itself. So um, really grateful to be on, on this piece of land now and, and continuing to work within the communities that surround me. Okay, okay so again, I want to sort of step back just a second um, Without, without making anybody, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges, some of the things that we're designing for, uh, some of the challenges that we face. And these can be very overwhelming at times, right? At this point in history, humans kind of feel like this puzzle piece that just won't quite fit, you know, and we, we, we almost feel out of place. It's, it's very easy to go down this rabbit hole of feeling like we're just this destructive species. And, and what I want to propose to you today is that we absolutely are not, that we are a force of regeneration. We are a force for good. Um, and, and I'm going to show you some strategies on, on how we can do that or some patterns of how we can begin to develop that lens so that we can fulfill that function of, of being a force for good, a force of, for, for regeneration, right? So, you know, navigating these sort of world scale challenges, you know, peak oil, which I'll talk about a little bit, pandemics, pollution, peak phosphorus, financial collapse, soil loss, oh my, which one should I focus on? Which one should I design for? All of these are overwhelming. And it's really easy, right? We feel compelled to sort of cover our eyes and, and go about our day and, and, and hope for the best. And, and, and you can see it all around us. There's a lot of people who are just sort of doing this and going about their day and, and hoping that, you know, somebody with more power will be able to fix things or that technology will save us all. Uh, but, you know, it really doesn't have to be that way. In fact, if we want to enact positive change, if we want to be able to maneuver the myriad of problems that keep getting thrown our way, it's going to have to come from us. We are going to have to be part of that solution. We are going to have to activate and start regenerating landscapes and regenerating the cultures that surround us and building a better world from the ground up because let's face it it's not going to come from the top right um, so in order to understand the solutions that i'm going to propose today which again i'm going to be very brief uh in in describing some of these but we'll give you some resources for how you can dive deeper into some of these things in order to understand these solutions we do have to examine some of those challenges that we face right uh, so we know modern ag agriculture uh, can lead to desertification if we continue to destroy soils. Uh, we know that there's a problem with malnutrition, not just in third world developing countries, but in first world countries here in Canada, in the United States, in the European Union. There are there are issues with malnutrition, even even uh, amongst folks who are, are well to do financially. Right. Um, government overreach, AI, deforestation. Pick your pick your problem there. There's a there's a challenge out there for you. And, and they're all over the place. And we can't possibly hope to fix them all or, you know, at all. These are things that exist certainly outside of our sphere of control and they almost feel like they're happening to us. And what I hope is that by the end of this presentation that you feel empowered to take control over, uh, over your future and in tandem with the ecology that surrounds you. So I'm gonna break down just a couple of these, uh, these individual challenges that we think are, are very important to design for, that are important to understand. And then I'm gonna bring it back to that regenerative paradigm, to those solutions that I really want to propose to you folks today. Uh, so the first one is peak oil. Now, some of you may have already heard of peak oil, uh, but the, in short, we are effectively at the end of the oil age. What you're seeing in this graph is the, the, the peak of, of oil, right? So the sort of uh, age of fossil fuel, that's what you're seeing. It's just a little blip, a little blip in the history of mankind. If you go from 1000 BC all the way to you know, indefinitely into the future, you see that the, the, the fossil fuels that run our entire economy uh, is really just a little blip in the history of mankind. And we are now 
at the end of the oil age. We are now on the descent. We are in an energy descent period, right? We are at a point where it is starting to take more and more energy in order to extract the same amount of oil from the earth. And if that continues to happen, I mean, what are we going to see, right? We're going to see a point where it takes just as much energy to extract the energy and, and eventually exponentially more. Now, uh, it's been amazing, right? It's been an amazing ride. We've had massive boost in the availability of cheap, extremely powerful energy. Uh, we can power a vehicle that can drive us 120 kilometers an hour. We can heat our homes with this, this gas that can just be delivered in a giant truck that requires you know, the fuel to, to, to bring over. Um, I mean, we can move fossil fuels across the entire world. It's amazing. And what we've been able to power with it is nothing short of incredible, regardless of how you feel about, about oil and, and fracking and drilling and all of these things. It is a source of energy that we've extracted and that now powers our economy. But what happens when it becomes less and less available? What happens when it takes too much energy to extract the oil out of the ground to the point where it doesn't even make sense to do that anymore? That is inevitable. Uh, we can argue semantics as to whether when that's going to happen, but ultimately uh, it's, it's going to happen. It's a finite resource that we continue to extract, right? But our entire economy depends on it, continues to depend on it. In fact, we continue to grow thinking that it's going to be available to us forever. Perhaps technology will save us, right? Perhaps not. Now, the obvious solution that tends to be proposed to something like this is, well, okay, well, we need energy, so let's just switch completely over to renewable energy, which works in the short term. Uh, but really, all renewable energy does for us is it buys us time, right? It buys us time. Ultimately, when we build all of the equipment necessary to produce renewable energy, whether it be solar panels or micro hydro or, or wind turbines, um, what's happening is we're using oil to create these things and these things have a shelf life. They only last for so long. Maybe you're buying yourself, if you buy a good set of solar panels, you might be buying yourself 30 years of energy, 30 years of resilience in terms of energy. And that's fantastic. Um, but eventually all of these little components end up as waste, right? They all end up as waste. They all end up not working eventually or damaged or needing repair or, or replacement entirely. What happens when these components aren't available, right? Um, and so if we continue to grow forever, if we continue to grow in terms of our energy demands, uh, we're going to have to continue creating renewables. We're going to have to continue building these things and that's going to require oil. And as I've just described, the amount of available oil uh, is, is going to decrease over time. And so we really have to start designing for this energy descent and designing the need for energy out of our system over time. Now, the wonderful thing about renewable energy is that do, it does buy us time, which is really fantastic. But here's an interesting little statistic for you. If our energy needs continue to grow, let's say at 3% per year, in 300 years, we would need a Dyson sphere around the sun to power our economy. Right, which doesn't even make sense. We, can, we don't even have the, enough materials in the, in the galaxy to be able to build that. Um, but it, it just goes to show you that exponential growth, you know, infinite growth is, is completely impossible. That really what we need to move towards is a sort of degrowth economy. Now, what does this have to do with permaculture? Well, you know, permaculture gives you a system through which you can manage your ecological processes to utilize the energy of the sun more effectively, to utilize the energy of the wind more effectively. And uh, this is a system, uh, an ecological system that is anti-fragile. In other words, it gets better over time. It gets better with disturbance. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. It's this living capital that we can build for ourselves. Now, another one of these challenges that we face is a broken succession cycle. Now, this is an illustration of how, you know, a ecological succession may or may not work, right? So on the left-hand side, we have a sort of mature ecosystem. And Either we log it or we, we burn it, depending on, on what part of the world you're in. Uh, we bring it down to sort of nothing and then we plant annual plants, right? And that tends to be very typical of, of agriculture in the world. We, we destroy these climax ecosystems and we plant annuals again and again and again and again. And eventually we deplete the nutrients that, are, that exist there and, and we have to continue adding inputs, consistently adding inputs um, to maintain that, that that little piece, that one to two years of annual plants, that little place in succession, we try, to, we try to hold ourselves in that piece of succession, but nature doesn't want to do that. Nature wants to move towards a climax community, a climax ecosystem, uh, a diverse, multi-layered, three-dimensional 
climax ecosystem, and we continue to try to hold it in stasis, which of course is, is unnatural to do. And as a result, we require more and more inputs. And where do those inputs come from? They come from oil, right? The oil we eat. Um, and so there we are. We, we're, modern agriculture is really holding our ecosystems in stasis, right? And it's been holding it in stasis for far too long. It's gotten us by so far, but we're seeing how difficult it is to continue to sustain this now. And ultimately what happens is, is if we continue, and this has been proven time and time again over history, if we continue to raise these climax ecosystems, if we continue to try and maintain an ecosystem in annual production, and we eliminate the you know, evapotranspiration of, of the trees and, and all of these ecosystem processes that otherwise would have existed in that place, we eventually create a desert because we continue to raise the soil over and over and over again. And we leave the soil bare and we're left with a desert. And there's not a lot that we can do with the desert um, although Jeff Lawton would probably prove me wrong. Um, so there we are. Let's move on from there. Right, so, you know, we're looking at corn, right? This is a monocrop. So we are, we are, again, this is, this is an example of, you know, an early stage of a successional system. This also applies to our built systems as well, right? If we remove, there's are really needed as part of these ecological cycles too, right? This isn't all about plants and trees. When we separate the animal from the ecology that supports it, we have to now combat the disease that, that, that results with toxic input. Because when we break something out of a natural rhythm, when we break something out of a natural cycle, we now have to treat it artificially in order to continue to sustain it. Um, and then, you know, what we do is we remove animals from a system and we place them all into these little boxes and then we eliminate anything in nature that we don't deem useful and we draw squares all over the place and we plant houses wherever the heck we want. Um, and we, we pay no mind for the ecosystems that surround us that once supported us, like indigenous cultures of the past all over the world have proven time and time again, you can certainly live in partnership with these systems. What we do in our modern agricultural systems and our conventional sort of systems is we try to separate everything into it, its individual components and we try to capitalize it as best as we can right so we we try to get as many units of energy out of one little piece as possible but again not taking into account the uh, impossibility of infinite growth that we are uh, that we're experiencing uh, so again we're, we're moving what we really want to do here is move towards of climax community is to build this three-dimensional this layered ecosystem that can provide us um, and and across multiple generations right so another piece that we're dealing with and again i promise you folks i'm i'm, I'm almost done dealing with the challenges and getting into the solutions here but one other really important piece are broken water cycles and that's why i'm really happy that chris brought up uh water earlier on when we were first starting because our water cycles are, are incredibly important. And uh, it feels like, you know, we call it the blue planet. It feels like there's infinite water on Earth. But in fact, you know, most of that water is not really usable, right? 97.5% of the water on Earth is salt water. That leaves 2.5% of all the water on the entire planet is fresh water. 2.5% is fresh water, usable water that we can drink, um that we can use for for you know watering our plants um the the water that sustains our life and our livelihood is only 2.5 percent of all the water on earth water is not really a renewable resource it's a resource that moves around um but it's not really a renewable resource and 40 percent 40 percent of global agriculture production depends on irrigation Right. What happens when that water is not available anymore? What happens when we deplete that fossil water, those aquifers that we're dealing with? What happens when the rain stops uh, or slows down or during a drought year? We see this time and time again. These things are becoming exponentially worse. How do we design for these things? Right. Um, so and of course, irrigation. I mean, just the, the, the idea of mechanical irrigation with pumps and lines depends, again, on energy fueled by, you guessed it, oil. Uh, and so what do we do then? We drain properties so that we can grow corn, soy, and wheat, and canola, and we build homes in floodplains, and we dredge, and uh, we, we, we dredge, uh, you know, and, and interrupt the meandering flow of, of streams by just creating straight lines for, for ease of drainage. Uh, we have heavy industry that pollutes our waters. We don't really pay much mind to the, to the water that passes through our property, that passes through our landscapes. Uh, if I ask most of you to identify 
your watershed, uh, would you be able to do it? Would you be able to trace the lines of the watershed that surround you? Very important exercise to be able to do to develop this eco-literacy. Okay, so there's all sorts of things that we can focus on. I, and really, I, I could theoretically spend all day talking about the challenges that we face, but that's not what we wanna focus on. Um, and so I wanna talk to you about your sort of global sphere of concern, which is, you know, these are the things that happen externally, the things that are happening all around you or the things that are happening to you, the things that you have very little control over, right? Inequality, uh, carbon emissions, peak energy, gigafam and soil erosion debt crisis, peak phosphorus, uh, health, biodiversity loss, you know, the, the loss of nutrition and our food, um, economic collapse, all of these things exist within our global sphere of concern. These are things that we see that we that are plainly put into our face consistently. If you spend any time in front of a in front of a screen or on social media, or if you turn on the radio, or you turn on the TV, or you read the newspaper, that's all you see, right? There's all sorts of problems out there. But in reality, there's not much we can do about that. If we spend all of our time, um, you know, really sitting down and, and focusing on these things, we're not going to get anything done. Now, your concern, the, cons the, the what's happening in the world, uh, you shouldn't ignore it necessarily. But it should inform, it should just inform your actions. You know, take a peek, take a peek, and then focus back in on your sphere of influence. Your sphere of influence is what you actually have control over, right? So these are the things like your shelter, um, the water that runs through your property or within your home, the, the water you have access to, right? Um, the food, you know, Chris went ice fishing, you know, he has, he, his, within his sphere of influence is all of the ecosystems that surround him while he's ice fishing. He gets to decide how he interacts with that ecosystem. Um, the energy that, that passes through your property, both the solar energy and, and otherwise, uh, the community, the people that you interact with, that's arguably the most important part of the whole thing. Um, we're not looking, you know, in permaculture, there's a lot of people will type in permaculture and they'll see these beautiful little permaculture designs and they're really gorgeous on paper and they think, oh, I'm going to move to the middle of nowhere and I'm going to design myself a perfect system and I'm going to live off grid and I'm going to have everything I need. I'm going to grow all of my own food and I'm, Oh, I'm going to be alone, right? You don't want that. You don't, you need community. You need culture. You need to be building culture, which is sorely needed in our society. Now, uh, we really need to surround ourselves with like-minded community, with people who are moving in the same direction, who share the same paradigm as us, which is why, again, I'm, I'm totally grateful that all of you are here listening to me, listening to Chris, to the other speakers today, uh, because it's, it's so incredibly important that we connect with each other and we build community. And that's really an appropriate use of technology. And I'm, I'm so glad that we're able to do that. But it's really important to connect with the community that surround you as well. So those are the things that you really have control over. And I'm going to be showing you some strategies today for how you can sort of organize a property design, specifically uh, if you're living on a piece of property. Again, regardless of how big, I'll use a little case study for today, but um, regardless of how big, the, the goal here is that I'm not going to be focusing on the individual components, the little pieces, the baubles, the, the ponds and the, the, the gardens and the, the orchards and all of that stuff. I'm not going to be describing those individual things. We'd be here for days if I were to do that. But instead, I'm going to be talking about the patterns that you can employ regardless of where you are so that you can start to develop that eco literacy. So you can start to develop that lens. And it really all starts uh, with your paradigm. So we're going to be talking uh, now about inspecting your paradigm or what's a paradigm it's the way that you view the world it's the way that you make decisions it's 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 the the way that you interact with the world and and our paradigms change often our paradigms for the most part are informed by the culture by the dominant culture right um but we're you know we're lucky that we get to be in this sort of free thinking society we get to consider our place in the universe and so i want to propose to you three different paradigms uh, that exists in our in our sort of dominant culture and in reality I would argue that only two of them are are, are dominant and the other one is growing and I suppose you can guess as to which one that might be so on one hand the degenerative paradigm places us uh, on top above nature right we are masters of nature um, we sort of this tends to lead to people viewing nature as as a, a, as a means to an end or as an object or as a resource to be extracted it places us completely above everything else that exists on this earth. That's the degenerative paradigm. This can't continue. And, and I think we all agree we're all on the same page here that that absolutely can't continue. And it's coming to an end because we're, it's called the degenerative paradigm. We are degenerating our ecosystems. We're degenerating our cultures, our communities, our way of speaking to each other, of connecting with the earth and of connecting with, with nature, right, of, of, with our ecosystems. 
Now, the sustainable paradigm, this is something that is very, very common, very, very uh, common and, and predominant in, in the conversation. Uh, this is where we speak about, you know, uh, conservationism, for example, where we must preserve what is. Um, it, it, in short, the sustainable paradigm, and you, you see this word all over the place, it's thrown around like the word organic was not that long ago. Um, it sort of places us below nature. It says that, well, we're a threat. We're a threat to nature. And where that leads, ultimately, is leading us to a point where we decide, you know what, we have to design ourselves out of nature, that nature is better off without us. Um, and I, I would argue that that's absolutely not true. Uh, it, you know, of course, we feel a lot of guilt and and we feel as though we are the problem and, oh, the human race is so terrible for the earth. If only we were here. That's the sustainable paradigm. And that doesn't really lead us anywhere, right? It kind of locks us in place. Um, it doesn't really bring us anywhere. The paradigm that I want to propose to you folks today is the regenerative paradigm. And this is, this is saying that, you know what? Humans are a force for good. We can participate in ecological restoration and we can live happy, healthy lives while doing it. Uh, we have to position ourselves in order to do that, to accomplish that, to achieve well-being for ourselves, for the earth, the, the ecology around us, and the communities around us, and the generations that follow. In order to do that, we have to position ourselves as part of the ecosystem, uh, an essential part of the ecosystem, right? We are within the ecosystem. Our disturbance makes things better. And that's, the, that's where that word anti-fragility will, will come into play, because we are working actively with an ecosystem, we're manipulating it, we're observing it, we're applying the feedback that we're receiving from those ecosystems. And as a result, we are regenerating those ecosystems. We are making them better. We are uh, moving them towards abundance exponentially faster than if we were to leave them alone. That's our role as stewards and as caretakers of these ecosystems, is to work in tandem and in partnership with the natural processes that surround us. If we can recognize the patterns that exist in nature, then we can speak her language and then we can start communicating with her. And that's going to be really beneficial for us. So, you know, we're not masters of nature, nor are we slaves to it, but we are part. We are part of nature. And this here is just to give you a little bit of a rundown for, for where that. So, again, the degenerative paradigm, you know, uh, leads to, to suffering. It leads to fragility. It leads to collapse. You know, these, this is sort of obvious, and I think we're all on the same page. The sustainable paradigm, which says, you know, we're worse than nature, we are nature's enemy. You know, it could lead us perhaps to survival, uh, we say resilience here, but really, you know, just this the idea of, of stagnation, right? Just maintain, maintaining the status quo, maintaining what we have around us. Uh, we're delaying collapse, right? Whereas the regenerative paradigm leads to thriving ecosystems, to anti-fragility, as I've described it. To abundance, right? So we really have to position ourselves again with with reverence, with awe, with abundance, cooperation, justice, humility. We really have to focus in on that. And again, if we practice anti fragility, we are increasing the abundance through disturbance, through our interactions, right? Despite the fact that we may make mistakes along the way, uh, our net sort of uh, uh, contribution is is very positive. Okay, so enough about all that stuff. Let's talk about the opportunities. Uh, now, the opportunity that I'm going to propose is permaculture. And I'm going to assume that many folks in the room are fairly new to permaculture. If you're not, I hope you still learn something from these patterns here, or perhaps it'll be a refresher for you. But I want to propose this idea of a permaculture lens and designing with patterns in mind um, as we're looking to live with landscapes. And so what I want to do first is I want to contrast two different homesteads. Now, these are photocopies right out of the Permaculture Designer's Manual, uh, written by Bill Mollison, the co-founder of Permaculture, uh, along with David Holmgren. And I think it just really illustrates well, uh, you know, a traditional homestead versus what a permaculture homestead might look like. And I'm not going to break down all the individual components here, because again, we'll be here for far too long if I do that. Uh, but in short, on the left is what we might consider a typical small holding, right? We have a greenhouse over here. We have an orchard over here. We have our house over here, which is segregated from the rest of the property, and there's animals over here. And what you notice with this is that we have these individual components, right? This is here, this is, this is here. But what we're ignoring are the interactions between those elements, right? There's no real energy transactions happening. You have individual pieces, you manage them one at a time, and none of those components really uh, 
have much effect on the other. They're all segregated. We have straight lines drawn. And this is typical. You might see this as a homestead and you might think, oh, it's a diverse homestead. And I think it's a fantastic start. Uh, but through the power of design, we can achieve something a little more like what we see on the right. And on the right hand side, what we're really looking at here, right, is we have we have our house, yes, of course. We have a food forest that's very well integrated within our system that provides probably food, fuel, building materials, wildlife habitat. Uh, it's likely diverse in its composition. It's moving through that success successional cycle and managed in a way where it continues to be abundant in a th very three-dimensional level, right? So if you walked in that little food forest here at the north, you'd probably find mushrooms and you'd probably find nuts growing and you'd find fruit in the understory and vines with grapes or you know depending on on your ecosystem you'd have all sorts of things going on there and you'd have wildlife abound it would be a place that gives you really good spiritual well-being it would give you really good well-being in terms of nutrition it's a lovely place to be um we have gardens here that are working along the contours of the land so they're manage water very effectively. These are diverse as well, of course, because monoculture leads to pests that target a single crop. And so we value diversity, we value the edge. Uh, you'll notice here that we have trees that are protected from, from grazing and browsing animals. And these trees provide fodder, they provide fuel eventually. If you're from Ontario, think black locust, right? You have this beautiful tree that grows incredibly fast. It creates dense hardwood that you can utilize for building. You can use within five years, you can have this wood that you can utilize for fuel within your home. If you're burning a wood stove, very effective stick fuel, uh, building materials, fodder for animals. The flowers are edible. They attract pollinators. This is the idea of stacking functions, which we're going to talk about a little bit as well. Uh, it's this idea of energy transactions between all of the elements that exist within a design. And so that's what's happening here. You have a beautiful pond here where you have ducks floating around, the ducks to provide meat and eggs, and they provide fertile plants that surround them. And then you provide, you know, fertigated water that you can spread around. And you've got a little wind turbine here that can just uh, pump some water for you and move it around. Um, there's probably fish under there. You get the idea. This is an ecosystem that we're designing. And if we're mimicking nature, if we're copying nature's design, then we are focusing in on the energy transactions between the various elements in that system. Everything communicates with each other. Everything provides a function. In fact, everything provides multiple functions. There's this idea in permaculture of stacking functions. And we almost make a game of it. How many functions can you identify for a single item? It's another really great exercise for developing your eco-literacy. If you were to walk around your home or if you were to walk around your landscape or your local parks or your municipality, try to identify how many functions each individual element serves and then try to actually link them together and see how those individual functions or those individual components actually interact with each other. When you start thinking that way, and eventually something clicks and you can't turn that off. You know, I love driving in the passenger seat of a vehicle because I love looking at landscapes and identifying the key lines and identifying uh, where a pond might be in a landscape. And I get really excited about all these little things because you develop this lens, this eco-literacy over time. And it's a way of looking at landscapes uh, I would even say it's a way of looking at life in a way that is so incredibly holistic and fulfilling because a lot of these solutions become incredibly intuitive when that, that happens. Okay, so when we design uh, in permaculture, we have this aura of permanence, right? And so that's what you're looking at now, geography uh, being the sort of most permanent aspect. It's argue, you might argue that climate belongs on the top, but I would say that climate might change a little faster than the, the minerals under your feet. So I suggest that geography is at the top. Certainly we do at Verge. Soil being at, at the far bottom because soil is the most malleable of all of them. It's the thing that is quickest to change, right? Now, when we decide, when we're trying to design, decide how to design our homestead, right? Again, regardless of whether it's urban or rural or otherwise, um, the changes that you can make higher up in this scale are gonna have cascading effects on all of the pieces that exist below, right? So soil is low hanging fruit, but at the end of the day, if you were to work as close to the top as possible, you're gonna have a much larger impact, positive impact, impact, I sure hope, if you're being careful with your design, on everything else that exists. Um, so, you know, your geography and your climate at the very top are almost impossible to change, at least maybe not by you. 
that's going to be determined by where you choose to settle, right? If the geography and climate of your area is not conducive to your well-being, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to I'm going to suggest that you might want to relocate to another geography or climate, or find a way to increase your well-being in the place that you are. Water access and structures; those are the three components I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, this is where we can have the most impact, and really where we should start when we get down to the nitty-gritty of a design uh, on on a piece of paper. And I'm going to be demonstrating a property that I uh, that I own, that that I've I've designed. I'm going to I'm going to show you one iteration of of a design for that property today that I did just in Google Earth. And I know there's at least one member in the audience today, Cassie, that that I uh, that I've worked with in the past and, and and learned from in the past that is way better with Google Earth Pro than I am. But uh, in short, uh, that's that's how we're going to design a property, right? Water access structures, and then everything else follows, right? Fencing, flora, fauna, business, technology, soil, all those things can happen. Those are all the little details that follow. Now. Most homesteaders tend to start at the bottom, right? So you get onto a piece of property, you get really, really excited and you think, oh, I've got to build soil. The first thing I need to do, I need to work on building my soil so that I can garden. And then, okay, well, I need to make sure that I have all the technologies that I need to build the soil. So let's go out and get the tractor. Let's make sure that we set up our solar panels. Let's set up our internet connection or whatever it is, right? Let's get the technology in place. And then, okay, well, maybe we'll talk about trying to kickstart a business maybe we want to start a market garden or maybe we want to start a consulting business or i just want to work from home that's a great start uh, and then we'll bring in animals right we get really excited and gung-ho about bringing in chickens and then chickens lead to pigs and then pigs lead to cows and all of that stuff uh, and then we plant trees and then we you know oh shoot i didn't get my fencing quite right and i you know so i'm, I'm putting up fencing now all of a sudden folks tend to get it backwards if we start at the top and we design, and this is where permaculture tends to differ, uh, if we design for geography, climate, but then water access and then structures, then we can really design with ecological patterns in mind, particularly as it pertains to water. Everything revolves around water. Water is life, but water also dictates our movement through the landscape. In New Zealand, a lot of the roads were determined by just observing sheep because sheep don't like to get their feet wet. And so the path that sheep would take would typically tend to be the driest path. And that's where they would position their roads because they were designing with water in mind, right? This is really the lens, the first, the first piece of the lens beyond that paradigm shift that we need to incorporate uh, that we really need to focus in on is how do we design with water in mind? Okay, so I'm gonna get into my little case study here. Now, this piece of property is, is 10 acres. You're looking at about four, four of those acres. Um, and it's in eastern Ontario, and uh, it's sort of at the bottom of a watershed. So a lot of water sort of pools there. What you see to the southeast there is um, uh, a wetland, a forested swamp, uh, a lot of willow and, and dogwood and things like that that are growing there. And that's a new house that we built. Now, I, I position it there uh, for you to look at it. But in reality, if we were designing this from scratch, we would design for water first, which is what we did. Um, but it's there now, so I wanted to, to show you that. Now, the first thing that we're going to do, so I'm going to go through, I'm going to take you through water access and structures. And my hope here as I go through this, and again, I'm going to be fairly quick as I do that, but as I do, I hope that you can start imagining maybe you're on a, a rural property or even on an urban homestead and you have a backyard. Start thinking through how water moves through the property and how you might be able to design around that. And I'm just going to show you an example, albeit a relatively complex example for how we might do that. So for designing for water first, I have this piece of property. The first thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to look for contour lines, so lines of equal elevation, and I'm going to observe how water already moves through my property. Does it move above ground? Does it move below ground? How close to the surface? At what time of the year? Are there gullies? What is my watershed? What's my catchment area? In other words, how much water am I catching from my landscape, from my local watershed? Uh, what is the source of all that water and what is the sink, the river or the pond or, or, or the groundwater? Where does the water go? And then you can start playing Plinko with water, right? And so for us, the water sort of starts at the, at the top here. We have a little bit of a gulf that runs towards the center. Uh, and then at the base here, we have a high groundwater table that, you know, most farmers in our area just drink their hay to drown or um or, or what have you right they don't want their feet wet uh, so they drain the water because you know high and dry is, is is better for business i suppose uh but i propose designing for the ecosystem that your ecosystem wants to be 
Uh, and, and so what we're doing here is we're determining where water wants to, understanding that some elements want to be dry and some elements want to be wet. And so what we've done is we, along our journey, we've built some very simple uh, uh, ditches here that will help us to divert some of the water because it's one of those elements that you want to keep dry. Uh, but we don't want to just drain that water away. And most people will agree with what I'm saying in terms of a road. It's not uncommon to see a road ditch, but moving that water away as quickly as possible tends to be the ultimate uh, uh, sort of prerogative, right? So what we're doing here is we're capturing rainwater at the very top. So we're designing plain plinko. So we're starting at the very top of our homestead, at the very top of our property, and we're finding the highest point, uh, in this case being the roof, of my home, right? The highest point on a landscape from which we can capture water. That's going to be one of our sources of water. Uh, we're going to divert that into a natural swim pond over here. Then we can drain that into a swale, a swale being a ditch of equal elevation along a line of a contour line on our property. This helps us flow, sink, and spread water, which is uh, sort of a mantra here in, in, in permaculture to slow water down, to use it as much as possible, sink it into the ground where it can be used. Um, yeah, and to, to spread it out across the property, right? So that's what a swale is going to help me do in this particular case. It's not necessary for all, all context. Uh, and then we follow the water down. We have water going into fish ponds where, the, where there's a dugout and I can potentially harvest fish here at our table. And then ultimately uh, into, the, into the wetlands, which is a, you know, a floodplain. We have a 100-year floodplain here. So it's a way of mitigating against uh, against flood. It's a, a way of mitigating against drought. It's a way of spreading the water across all of the seasons and not trying to fight the ecosystem that my property wants to be, right? So one very important thing that you need to ask yourself when designing a piece of property is how does your property interface with water, right? So again, how does water move through your property? And then understanding that some elements either want water or absolutely do not. It really is cut and dry. A house does not want water. A foundation does not want water. A road does not want water. Uh, an annual garden doesn't want to be flooded. Um, and so you have to understand uh, what needs water and understand what your sources of water are. Is it groundwater? Is it rainwater? Is it water that runs from a stream? Is it a spring? Trying to understand those things. And then as you're designing for water, understanding your needs, right? We need to drink, we need to water plants, we need to irrigate our landscapes, we need healthy pastures, whatever it may be. But understand that um, it's very, very important to redundancy in our systems. Understanding that uh, while you might have a ground well, for example, that it may also be wise to design a rainwater harvesting system. So you have that redundancy. If one fails, you have another. And that's another very key component in designing a homestead in a very ecological way is we want to develop that anti-fragility or that resilience at least uh, then we're going to need to be redundant in the systems that we are uh, designing in but what are we designing them for right uh, peak water the availability of water potentially decreasing depending on where you are in the world we're, we're planning for drought uh, potentially contaminated water flooding i'm in a hundred year flood zone if i don't mitigate against flooding it might cause damage uh, to my land but more importantly it might you know, decrease the ecosystem function in general. So I have to let the, the, the natural ecosystem that's there absorb the water as it may and design accordingly, right? Um, right, so approaches to harvesting water, you know, you, maybe you have a well or municipal supply, rainwater, rain gardens, swales, key line, terraces, a harvesting fog if you're set up for that or you're in an environment to do that, gray water systems where you're harvesting your laundry, that sort of thing. So all these sources of water, Managing those things is incredibly important and something that's often overlooked on a conventional sort of homestead. Now, once we've designed for water, we can move into the next layer below that, which is access. So now that we have the water sort of systems laid out, and again, I'm not being too specific on these individual elements. The idea here to grasp is the pattern, the pattern that I'm describing. So once we have the sort of layout of the land in terms of water, moving water around, identifying where we want things to be wet and where we want things to be dry, then we can start designing for access. We can start designing for how we move through a property. We can start imagining our natural flow. And now a lot of this is often overlooked, right? We tend to put things further away, you know, a chicken coop in the corner of our yard, and we put this thing over here and, and what have you. Um, but in reality, we really need to be thinking through how we move through a property if we want to enhance our well-being. Uh, if we don't want to be, you know, creating drudgery for ourselves, creating work for ourselves, 
uh, in the process. It's very important that we understand how we flow through a property and taking time to do that. Before developing any of this, uh, I would watch my children run through a, a landscape. I would watch my dogs run through a landscape. You know, children and, and animals tend to take the path of least resistance, the most direct path to a thing, which consequently tends to be the best way to go. Uh, and so observing your landscape, taking the time to slow down, observe and interact with your landscape is going to help you determine how you might move through that landscape. Certainly once you've been informed by how water moves through the landscape and how you can design for water harvesting and water storage on your landscape or spreading the water. And so the, the pink there, of course, are the paths, the general sort of movement through my property as I moved along. Um, understanding that I would need to move around these water harvesting elements, that I could develop dry areas as a result of the water harvesting earthworks that I put into place. And so I can put little bridges here and there, and I can have a lot of fun. Uh, and this helps me sort of segregate, or, or especially if I'm working with a blank piece of land, it helps me take little portions out and say, okay, now I can start developing these zones, which I'll talk about here in a moment. But once I have my access, then I'm just filling in the blanks. I'm filling in the spaces in between with structures and structures includes the infrastructure the built infrastructure but also the trees the plants the things that you put into place whether they be living or material um, all of those pieces that fill the niches that that fill the edges of your property that generate abundance ultimately now if you were to in implement all of these structures before designing for water there's a very good chance that you have put a barn in the wrong place there's a very good chance that you just put a garden in the wrong place um, that your trees won't survive because they won't have enough water, right? So that's why it's so important to really start at the top of that scale of permanence, so to speak. And so then you can start putting in your gardens and you can put in your trellises and your, your little you know, plantings, your trees and your annual gardens and your pig systems and your agroforestry systems, all of those using the water access structures. Now, once you've done that, a design, you have to understand, is a living, breathing thing. It's not something that you can sort of one and done. You see these beautiful permaculture designs. Uh, often you see these consultants or these designers build these designs for folks and go, here you go, there's your design, that's it. And it insinuates that there's no need for observation. There's no need for constant adaptation, but that would be wrong. So when you get to this point, it's you know often very helpful to step back and figure out, well, you know, what are the zones? You, you have to be thinking of this early on, but what are the zones uh, of, of my permaculture design? And some of you may have already understood this or, or heard this concept of zones, and I'll try to briefly describe that to you now. Another way to think about your property in terms of how you move through it, right? So zone one being your, your area of, of most activity. These are the areas around your house, probably where your children play, probably where you're growing a garden. Um, this is, these are the spaces that you spend most of your time. You're, you're out there every day, if not twice a day or more. Um, and so you're going to be interacting with these spaces, right? So this is where I would keep a, a nursery, a small nursery that I could observe things. I would, I would plant a small orchard that has trees that exist further out in my property so that it allows me to observe when those trees might be flowering, for example, because my orchard is perhaps further from my house, right? So uh, my kitchen garden, where I can step out of my kitchen and very quickly harvest things as I'm cooking on the stove, um, where I could watch my children play and, and all of this sort of thing. So this is this is your zone of, of intense well-being, zone one, right? Zone two are the places that you visit pretty often, but maybe not as often, right? So maybe once a day, maybe not even that. Your chicken coops, your, uh, your compost piles, you know, your perhaps your, your food forest, your forest garden, your orchard, however you want to call it. Zone three being your areas of pasture, larger animals that might move around, larger agroforestry systems, larger production systems. Perhaps zone three is where you run a business uh, and you visit that business very intentionally. It's not something that you live and breathe on a single, uh, every single you know, moment of the day. It's not constantly in your face. Zone four, perhaps extensive forestry, your, your, your larger forest, perhaps you go in there to uh, very gently harvest timber, you manage it a little bit, but lightly. And then zone five, very important one, this is the wildlife zone. These are the untouched zones. This is the classroom of the permaculture design. Uh, in my case, it's a riparian area where I certainly don't want to, uh, to mess you much. I want to allow for the ebb and flow. You can see here where the river's been dredged and the natural sort of meandering uh, river has been 
I'd like that to be preserved as much as possible and allow for the wildlife and the migratory birds and the, the turtles that exist there and the frogs that exist there to continue to thrive so I can visit it with my canoe when it's flooded or, or, or hiking in the middle of summer and I can observe that ecosystem and take those lessons back with me to, uh, to, the, to the upper zones, the zones that exist closer to my house. Now, for you, that might be a wildlife sanctuary nearby. For you, that might be a park. It might be a, a, you know, a natural ecosystem that exists around you. That's your zone five. And we wanna make sure that we have time to interact with that as well. All right, so I'm gonna get through the next few slides here relatively quickly, and then I'll open it up. Hopefully there's some time for, for questions and comments. There's a lot to unpack in a lot of this. Um, now this, this design sort of science or this, this lens applies to a lot of things, built structures included, right? So we can take this idea of stacking functions of designing according to natural patterns, right? The positioning of the sun, depending on the time of year, your dominant winds, the slope, your water table, how water moves through a property, the needs that you need out of a home, all of these things can be really jam packed into just a house, right? Look at all these individual elements and all of these are stacked functions. All of these serve multiple functions. They're all correctly placed. They interact with each other really well. Uh, this is permaculture design in a house, right? Uh, absolutely doable. And there's another example. Those images, by the way, come from David Holmgren's book, Retro Suburbia, which I absolutely recommend. It's such a fantastic read for those who are getting into permaculture, especially if you're on a suburban lot. Uh, but a wood stove, right? I have a wood cook stove in my home. It is the center of my home and it serves multiple functions, right? A wood stove can heat your water. It can cook your food. It can heat your space. It can provide a, you know, warmth, of course. Um, I use it to start my plants, uh, you know, early, early on in the season in February, early March, when it's still cold outside. The plant shelf is near my wood stove. My dogs use it to rest. I dry my boots with it. I dry my clothes with it. All of these different energy interactions that exist around one central element because we're stacking functions and we're tracing the link between all of the elements. So, you know, um, that, that, that's what happens when we start looking at the world through this permaculture lens. And there's a few questions that, that really help us um, sort of understand whether or not we're looking at, at, at things in that way. This is, and, and so when you're designing a system for your property, uh, ask yourself, is every need of every element met within the system? Is every yield of every element used within the system? Are you creating waste or are you utilizing that yield? Are you investing it back into the system or are you investing it in yourself as part of system, right? Is every element are serving multiple functions within the system, stacking functions? Um, and it should. Is every function required by the system uh, served by multiple elements within the system? Have you built redundancy into your system or do you have the fragility of having one, all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, right? All of your elements uh, in, within your system sort of being served by one input or something like this. You know, if, if your home is heated only by propane, what happens when propane is too expensive? What happens when the delivery truck doesn't make it to your door? Can you heat your home? Um, is the system and its elements functioning ethically? And this is important too, right? In, in permaculture, we have these three ethics, earth care, people care, and uh, fair share or future care, depending on how you interpret it. Um, and so you have to you have to exist within that that regenerative paradigm and you have to exist sort of ethically in order to be able to uh, to implement a system like this and ensure that it continues uh, ethics being what will propel us into the future. Are we designing for future generations or are we designing for short term gain uh, gain? I would I would argue for the former. Okay, so with that being said, I think we're a little bit out of time. So I just want to let you know that if you want to dive deeper into all of this, we do offer a free introduction to permaculture course that you can take. There's the link, and I suspect we'll put that in the chat. Um, so if you want to if you want to dive deeper into these individual points, uh, Rob Avis has you know has, has developed this fantastic introduction to permaculture course that you can check out, 100% uh, free, and it really goes through some of these details. We go through some of the challenges. Uh, as I've described, so so Rob will do a, a great job at diving deeper into some of these challenges. Uh, we get into permaculture principles. We get and then and then finally we end with strategies for actually putting permaculture into practice. The individual strategies for all of those things. Um, yeah, so actually I'll leave that displayed here for you folks. And uh, if you're intrigued to learn more about how you can garden in a northern climate or in a cold climate, so that you can store food all year round. We also have a uh, free live webinar coming up that you can attend as well. If you like this sort of live interaction and you're enjoying this sort of format, um, that's gonna be a great one coming up here uh, actually just next week. 
but I think we'll put the link for that in the chat as well. Uh, and with that, Chris, I, I think I'll leave it there. I think I might have went a little bit. Oh, that's time. fine. Huh? That's great, Alain. Thank you so much. Uh, folks, I did just put up, actually, there should be a pop-up on your screen for the free web class that Alain mentioned, the Garden Design Strategies for Year-Round Food. Uh, so if you want to sign up, that's there. And then I think Charles just put the course, uh, the link for that more involved course uh, Alain put out. So I'll put that in the, the follow-up email as well. So yeah, if you got a couple more minutes, Alain, I'd, I'd love to do a couple of questions. Are you good for that? Yeah, I'm happy to awesome. hang out, sure. Uh, maybe I'll start off with one. So, oh, somebody had just asked about um, a book that you'd reference, um, a permaculture book, David Holgram. Oh yeah, Retro Suburbia. Retro Suburbia, okay. That is a fantastic book, Retro Suburbia. Sweet, I haven't book. heard that one. That actually may, I have, maybe, maybe not, uh, leads into what I was uh, gonna ask about. So we, you gave an amazing break. I really appreciate it. Just kind of looking at the principles of like a piece of property and starting with water and then infrastructure and just how you build up there. And even though we didn't get to go into the nitty gritty, uh, I think people can start to imagine that it's a design process. Uh, what I'm thinking right now, somebody that's watching tonight and they're like, you know, I dream of one day, you know, buying that small piece of land or partnering and having the little homestead. But like right now I live in an urban setting and you know maybe it's a small little house maybe mm. it's got a little backyard uh maybe i even rent it you know so like making major changes isn't even an option thinking about this concept of um um infrastructure and anti-fragility do you have some examples of what might be some like high leverage first steps someone could take if they're not even at the homestead stage to like start thinking about their current setup and making it a little more anti-fragile like what what where could they stack functions what would be high leverage as at least a starting point in that direction, if they feel like that's still like a leap from where they are right now. Yeah, so part of what we teach are the are eight forms of capital, right? That there are more forms of capital out there that, that you can have access to. We have uh, financial capital, which is when I say the word capital, that's what most people understand. And then, but there's living capital, there's spiritual capital, there's material capital, there's all these forms of wealth. And what you need to do is if you don't have access to the living capital that is a piece of land yet, there's a lot you can do to really prepare yourself for that. And the very first thing that I, that I tell people is to get out there and start building community. Go volunteer, go offer some of your living capital in the form of time and build some social capital. Go build some relationships, go meet people with land, go and learn some stuff. Which brings me to my next point, which are skills. Um, I think that if I had to choose between a piece of land and the skill required over the last couple of decades, I would choose the skills hands down because you can carry those no matter where you go, if, if we strip the clothes from your back and, and we put you in the middle of nowhere, you've got yourself, your knowledge, and the skills that you have. So it's never too early to start building skills. And then the third thing that I would recommend is if you have the capacity, start collecting plant material. If you have a piece of land in your future, if you envision that coming soon enough, start collecting plant material, start a nursery. You could do that on a, on a driveway. You can, you can build, uh, um, little air prune boxes, which are just these little square boxes. And you can put, you know, half inch hardware cloth on the bottom of that. And you can just plant some, go and forage some seeds or, or go collect some plant material from plants that you find incredibly interesting and start growing them in pots, start trading them, use them as currency. It's a really fantastic thing. And it's a great way to meet people. So get out there, uh, join a permaculture guild, join a group that's doing really interesting stuff. Uh, look up transition towns. See if there's a transition town in a group in your area. That's a great place to start. That's where I started. Um, CD Saturday events. If there's any of those going on, check it out. Just look, look for a permaculture guild if there's already one. If you're in Calgary, there's a fantastic uh, permaculture guild in Calgary that you can connect with. And um, and those are your people. You know, so that's that's a great place to start. And when you get on that piece of land, uh, whether it be a backyard or or a, a full-on farm or a community housing situation or whatever it is. Uh, you'll be ready. You'll have the skills necessary. You'll have the right paradigm. You'll have that eco literacy to really just expedite your progress. Uh, really, awesome. really quick way. And you know, there are some amazing case studies that can people keep people can look at at what people are doing with like small urban properties. You know, like literally catching rainwater and having it flow into yeah. aquaculture setups, like in very small spaces. You know, I te I teach people mushroom growing in like in a two foot by two foot corner of a house. Like you can actually grow a lot of food in an incredibly small space. Uh, if the conditions need it, you know? You know, so. Yeah, when I was in an apartment, I grew mushrooms on coffee grounds and, and sterilized straw. I mean, it was, we had gray oyster mushrooms growing in the kitchen, no yard whatsoever. Uh, we had herbs growing on our, on our patio. Um, I raised quail. 
for eggs. I mean, it was, there's so much you can do. Space isn't the limiting factor. It's our relationship to others and our ingenuity and our pattern recognition. Those are the things, once we develop those, uh, space isn't an issue. In fact, sometimes when you have less space, it just forces you to be more creative, which is yeah, more fun. Yeah, I've seen people doing really cool things, like even doing like vertical potatoes and vertical strawberry rows and stuff, you know, on like urban porches. And so that's great. Uh, Cassie's asking here, what's your yeah. biggest challenge been in implementing the design on your land so far? Ah, uh, Cassie, I'm so glad to see you here. Cassie's really <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, my biggest, my biggest challenge in implementing my design has been, gosh, wind. Yeah, wind. We, we, you know, uh, we purchased a property that's not very forested. We got it at a great deal, but there's just, there's a lot of wind that passes through and getting plants established in a windy site is difficult. So you have to rely on things like infrastructure. You have to rely on, uh, you know, quick growing wind breaks and things like this. So it's definitely slowed down. Yeah, slowed down some of the progress, but hasn't halted it. We've built a barn. We've got animals going on. We've got trees in the ground. We've got gardens that are growing. So it's just incremental growth and, and understanding that we're designing over time. Cool. We'll take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, so Shandi, I think I'm pronouncing that. Shandi is asking about um, thoughts on vertical gardens that companies are selling with pods. So I guess maybe the question is like twofold, like one, what are your thoughts? Like, is this a good idea? And two, are like, if, if are there any that you actually recommend or that you like for people looking for to invest in some infrastructure like that? Yeah, um, I'm a little bit on the fence. So I, I used to promote them. I'm not a big proponent of hydroponics. I, I, I think it's really important to grow in tandem with soil. So I think that's really important. If, if you can grow in soil, I think it's really important that you do. That being said, I have installed hydroponic towers in classrooms and they've been successful and they've been a fantastic learning experience. And I think they're a really great way to grow if you're limited on space and what you have access to is an indoor environment. Um, I think they're fantastic. I think growing vertically is great. Um, if you want a, a low cost or a low um, input version of that, you can do that with um, strawberries. I grew strawberries in a large uh, uh, PVC pipe or I, I grew them in um, uh, old eaves troughs, you know, uh, really shallow rooted plants. And you can do that in soil. Um, I grow <laughs> a little interesting thing. I think you can find this one on, on the Vert Permaculture YouTube channel, but I grow lemons in my house. Uh, in a in a whiskey barrel, right? So it's full of soil, doesn't take up that much space. It just sits in a self-facing window, and it's currently flowering. We're getting our second round of fruit. Uh, seven months later, we'll have we'll have Meyer lemons. Um, that's just inside. That has nothing to do with with my land. So there's a lot that you can do indoors with soil. I would say try that first. Um, but I'm 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 totally cool with hydroponic growing if that's your option. Yeah, and there are yeah. some vertical setups that are utilizing soil now too, right? So. Just yeah oh there are yeah that's right and, and there's some really great uh systems out there gosh i can't remember the names but yeah you just you set them up in pods i think that's what shandi is talking about um and you just insert those pods into these systems and, and you just keep exchanging them out so it requires some management and and some uh fertility management yeah. man production awesome. is you got a little yeah. verma composter under your sink then you can put your gar kitchen scraps in there and turn that into the uh, fertilizer that then goes into your little vertical garden pods and yeah, and if you have kids, and especially if you're homeschooling them, but if you have kids, there's some really great projects you can get into. Vermicomposting is a fantastic one, just a, a tote. Uh, quail, hatching quail. We built a homemade incubator and we hatched quail. That was an amazing experience. And we had quail on, you know, very, very small, in a very small lot. What's, what's the minimum size eggs, piece is, of land someone would want for something like that or a chunk in a lot to do quail, do you think? Do you have a rough idea? For quail, oh, all you got to do is build a little, you could do it in your garage. I'm not a big fan of, of birds in cages. Uh, the way that we raise them is we built, it costs us zero dollars, and we built uh, a little greenhouse set up. And we had that, we were stacking the functions out of that thing, let me tell you. It was a greenhouse. Uh, it was built out of old windows and pallets. We grew plants in there. We were composting on the ground in situ. And then on the ground as well, they were protected, of course. We had quail roaming in the greenhouse. And I was experimenting with whether or not they would eat my tomatoes and my peppers and my basil. The answer to that is everything but the tomatoes. Um, and they would lay eggs. They just drop them wherever they are. And the greenhouse was 10 by 10. And we had, I don't know, 24 wow, quail in there. That's awesome. 
Well, thanks so much, Alain. I think maybe we'll leave yeah. it there. I'll just throw that up again. If anyone wants to check, you can check out the uh, the free garden design class coming up um, and check out Verge. I'll send up a follow up email. Um, just a reminder, folks, next week we have on Yarrow Willard. Um, so that's going to be a great talk talking about uh, working with mushrooms and food and kind of just proactive health. Uh, the week after that, we've got Starhawk and Charles coming in from Earth Activist Training. Um, and we're going to be chatting a little bit about community resiliency as well as diversity um, and equity, uh, being equitable in uh, sustainable design uh, with them. Um, after that, we've got, um, uh, let's see, uh, Caleb Musgrave, um, amazing, amazing man coming on with my wife, Laura. And they're actually going to be chatting about small scale homesteads as well as integrating foraging um, into your life in a sustainable way. Uh, we got Andrew McMartin coming up from the Pine Project. He's going to be talking about working with youth um, and raising youth for uncertain times. So uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of great sessions coming up. Hopefully you'll be back. Please help us share the word and have a great uh, night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Ellen. Uh, thanks, Charles, for having us in the background there and supporting on tech. Really appreciate it. And with that. My pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Charles. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Call it a wrap.